My name is Jessica Aguilar. I am a fifth year in the PhD program um, literature department studying Mexican and Latinx literatures from the 21st century. I joined the program in 2017, so a while back. Um, and I am originally from San Isidro, Tijuana border area, so I stayed local. Um, all my family is still in San Isidro, Tijuana area. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to finishing my dissertation in the next year. My mom, she was born and she grew up in the state of Sinaloa in Mexico. She actually traveled as an unaccompanied minor to Tijuana, where she ended up um, staying with some of her sisters. She came um, to the northern of the country because she wanted to pursue higher education. Um, she has always liked to study. She actually started um, elementary school year early because she saw her siblings going to school. And she's really from a tiny, tiny place. It's just a few houses. So she really enjoyed school as a kind of as a as a playground for her. Um, my dad on the other side, he was raised in Tijuana. He was also born in Tijuana. Um, he doesn't like school at all. So it was like the other side of my mom. And he's been in Tijuana for the entirety of his life. Um, and there's where they met. There's where I also grew up um, in Tijuana until I was 17 when I came to the university. So that city has really um, been where my family has, has come together and grown. I also identify as a transfronteriza, which means um, a person that works or studies or lives in both sides of the border. So usually a student or a person that lives in the Mexican side and works in the U.S. or vice versa. Um, we tend to believe that everyone is coming from Tijuana to the United States, but there's a lot and a huge population that does the opposite. They might live here in San Diego and they work in Tijuana. I identify as a transfronteriza growing up. Um, I did have most of my life in between both cities. So I would live a period of time in Tijuana and come to study in, in San Diego. Um, sometimes I would be in San Diego, but all the weekends will be spent in Tijuana. So majority of my life has been in both sides of the border for, for me growing up and thinking about the U.S. and Mexico as two separate countries was really hard because for me, it was that border, that border community was my home and I never really saw them as two separate, but as a unit. And it has really influenced who I am today because it really informs my, my academic work. So my PhD right now, I look into migration and Tijuana and San Diego have been um, historically cities that bring a lot of migrants in. So that, that really has been a big part of not only my life personally growing up, but also in my, in my research, the transfronterizo aspect being in both sides of the border. The philosophy around education growing up was, mm, let's say, not direct. <laughs> so I knew I had to go to school. My parents always motivated me to go to school, but it wasn't, we didn't really had um, anything direct or anything established. We didn't have a plan. We didn't know what was next for me. Um, my parents grew up in Mexico and they live most of their life in Mexico, so they didn't really know much about the the school system here in the United States or what was next for me here in the United States. Um, I think it was until I joined high school when I came to high school and I enrolled in an AVID class that I really started to learn about college. I really started learning about the possibilities after um, after high school. Um, but not necessarily through through my family, but through my teachers. Um, 
um, I was also able to to join college, to enroll in college because of an AVID fellowship or scholarship. So I was really grateful for that program, which was really the one that influenced and really the one that taught me um, more about my possibilities in the in education. Um, my mom always jokes that from an early age, I always was busy doing homework. She's like, you've always been busy doing homework. And they kind of laugh about that, but they've always seen that I've been interested in, in continuing um, my education. So they've always been supportive. It's just, it was just really hard because they didn't really know what was there for, for me and how to support me. So they will support me in non-academic ways. So after after high school, um, through high school, through the AVID program, actually, we were motivated to apply to as many universities and colleges as we could. Um, we had some waivers because we were low income students in San Isidro. So we applied to a lot of schools and I ended up choosing UCSD because it was closer to home. This was going to be a new adventure. Um, and also because it was one of those schools that gave me funding. I learned from an early age that, yeah, education was important, but also having the, the means and the finances to go to college was going to be important. And with my AVID scholarship, I was able to stay in San Diego. I was able to choose UC San Diego and, and start my, my education here. Um, so actually... <laughs> This is funny because I grew up, I've been here all my life. I've been in San Diego, Tijuana all my life, but I had never visited UCSD. So I had visited other campuses in LA and San Francisco through through the AVID program. They took us, but UCSD was so local to us that there was the assumption that we had all visited the campus. And my first time coming to UCSD was for my freshman orientation, I remember taking the bus, taking the trolley. Um, before, we didn't have the trolley that not, we now have, so that's a new line. Before, we, like it would take three hours for me to get from San Isidro here, um, but that was my first, my first time, actually, at, at UCSD, and I feel like it was a challenging moment. I came in in the fall to 2010, um, so a quarter, some a few months after the Com Compton Cookout events had taken place, I remember seeing in the news everything that was happening. And, you know, that makes you wonder if you want to come to a campus where brown students are not welcome, or that's what the news um, made it seem like, like they're not welcome. You know, there was a lot of, of controversy going on. Um, and during my during my orientation, I actually experienced a a little misunderstanding with a peer that really made me feel like maybe this was not the safest space for me. Um, eventually, as I started summer bridge, um, a few weeks after my orientation, I started to learn about the community that was here for me. And that was really when I began to see myself in at UCSD and when I really started to see the resources that there are there for students that come from low income families that are first generation students like me um, who might not have the support systems at home because their parents might not understand, but that they can find someone who will support them here at UCSD. Um, I started joining organizations. I joined MECHA. I joined a sorority for um, Latinas. And that's where I really found, found my community. In my undergrad, I majored in Spanish, Spanish literature and Latin American studies. And even though I wasn't involved a lot in like research projects or more of the academic side, I feel like I had a good experience learning to network with professors and network with other peers. And I ended up graduating in my four years and learning about graduate school, which was later on the, the next step I decided to take. 
When I came into UCSD, it was the fall after the Kangtan Cookout events, and I had just been through Summer Bridge. In Summer Bridge, we had learned about everything that had happened, and a lot of the folks that were kind of transitioning us into college were members in Mecha or were um, students from BSU. So a lot of the introduction we got to UCSD was kind of this um, protest environment, right? Like we're coming in and we're trying to change what's happening. So when I started my fall quarter, I really was invested in Mecha. I really went because in high school I had been in Mecha, so I already knew that space. And yeah, my fall quarter, I remember we were protesting. I believe it was Founders Day um, because there weren't many changes. And then throughout that year, my first year in college, there were a few other protests that um, that I was able to participate in. Some were supporting um, campus workers, and then others were really to try to make a change um, for, for students on campus. So right now we have the Chicano Legacy Mural, and a lot of uh, the story comes from those protests from the Compton Cookout events. So while I was in like in the center, I was in like one of the people who um, maybe voiced out um, all of these demands. Um, I did meet, meet a lot of those folks and I was there supporting uh, at many of these protests. So now when I walk through the Chicano Legacy Mural, for example, I, I'm always reminded that that wasn't supposed to be permanent, that that was just a plastic, like a plastic mural that was going to be taken down, but that because students protested and because we really wanted to see that the university listened to us and saw us, that now it's something permanent. And um, during the opening of the mural, I remember that a lot of students cried because they, they had been protesting for a few years now. Um, and now we have the resource centers and we have a little bit more visibility on campus, but sometimes it might be forgotten that it was students that were fighting for it. And I'm I'm proud to like have been there to to see some of the the compañeros fighting for it and actually had been in some of the organizing um, meetings for the protests as well. So senior year came and I was not sure what I was gonna do after graduating. Um, but I had seen some of my sorority sisters applying to graduate programs or to um, law school, to other programs. And that's when I learned that that was a possibility. So again, as a first gen, a lot of these, um, a lot of these processes you don't really know. I remember coming to CSD and thinking that graduating college meant just graduating after these four years and then you're done. And I started to learn that, no, that graduate school was also an option. Um, during my last year, during my senior year, I really focused on applying to different programs. Um, I applied to three programs, a Latin American Studies program here at UCSD, a Spanish program at San Diego State, and a Spanish program at New Mexico State University. Um, I got into the three of them and Eventually, it came back. It like it came down to which program was gonna fund me the most. Um, I decided to go to New Mexico State University because they were giving me a, a full fellowship to study with them. And this is a master's program, so master's programs are really hard to get funded. Um, usually, you won't get money to go to a master's program, and I was really fortunate to have this opportunity. And while a lot of people told me, like, oh, just stay at UCSD or just go to San Diego State, they might have more of a, of a name or more of a recognition, um, I just decided to that it was time for me to, to go. I also talked a lot to my professors when making the decision. I talked to um, my... Spanish literature professors, and 
they really gave me the advice to to go out um and they really encouraged me to go out of state which was something that I was really scared of and I'm so thankful and so grateful that I was that I listened to them that they were there for me um when I was trying to make this decision going to New Mexico State University really taught me that school can also be for Hispanics. New Mexico State University was a, is a Hispanic um serving institution and this was the first time that I learned about that and I also started teaching there. So that was when I really started to see myself as part of an institution as part of a university for the first time and I'm really grateful for for that opportunity of of seeing myself in in that space. As a first generation student and oldest of four and as a woman, <laughs> my parents did not like that I was going to leave um San Diego. So we had a, a similar um conversation when when I was going to join undergrad. I had various options, but my parents kind of got lucky i say in in the sense that i wasn't ready to leave so they were happy that i stayed and we didn't have this conversation um but later on for my graduate studies i told them um i need to i need to go here and this is where i am getting the money this is where i'm going to grow the most and while they weren't completely happy they understood they couldn't support me financially they understood that it was a masters program so it was only going to be two two years and eventually they were okay with the idea um and they always told themselves it's a masters program is two years two years go by really quickly and she'll be back um i wasn't sure if i was going to be back at the end i did come back to san diego but that was how I was able to navigate that and that was how I was able to talk to them about leaving and 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 allowing me to grow in a different state in a different community um but yeah definitely my parents were not fans of me leaving for the first time um because I was I was their first kind of experience also for them right like I'm the oldest so they had never experienced one of their children leaving or going away from college for college and now they're really excited now they're always encouraging my siblings to do whatever it was that I was doing and my siblings hate that <laughs> but it became some it became something positive At New Mexico State I started to learn about national conferences I started to learn about publishing and it was interesting to me because New Mexico State University is not a research university but it was because I saw more people like me and because I was able to have more of a voice that I started to to see the this opportunity to go into academia after those 2 years however I I didn't I didn't see myself in in a PhD program so what was there in my um during my masters I felt comfortable with what I had achieved and even though I saw a lot of my of my peers applying to PhD programs I also I also understood that it was a big commitment and at that point I wasn't ready to to make that big of a commitment um some professors from from few universities in Texas had actually reached out to me because of the work that I was doing and they invited me to apply to their programs but I wasn't ready so I actually came back to to San Diego and I started working um I work for as a case manager for a shelter for an accompanying minors here in San Diego and that's when i actually realized that i wanted to go back to 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 school and pursue a phd um while i was working as a case manager i heard a lot of a lot a lot of stories a lot of migration stories from from these kids and you learn a lot about human trafficking you learn a lot about abuse and you it's almost always like negative where you feel like there's a lot of negative stories 
but working with the with a lot of these teenagers and some really young children i started to realize that they didn't want the whole story to be negative so when we talk about migration we tend to like highlight the the negative aspects or the the bad things that migrants are going through and my kids were always telling me but there's also good and we would write together as as a literature major I always kind of invited them to have like little writing workshops or um, little journals and a lot of of my clients at the shelter will write poetry will write songs will write their own stories and um, there was one of them who told me, like, hey, Jessica, like, our stories don't matter. Um, no one wants to listen to our stories. And I think that was a moment when I was like, no, there's a lot of people who want to wanna hear your story and who are interested. And that's a moment when I realized that I wanted to come back to, to pursue a PhD in literature to kind of center these voices not necessarily all the negative but also the positive and also the the things that these kids were writing sometimes we read things that journalists write or that researchers or professors are writing about migration but what about like what migrants are writing about themselves which is super amazing like (laughs) their songs were amazing their poems I don't know how a 13 year old could think about such intricate like poetry structures they're they're amazing um and that's when I decided to to come back to to a PhD program so it wasn't necessarily through my experiences at the master's program which really influenced because it motivated me to see myself in this space but the the thing that really made it for me or that really pushed me was working with with the children and listening to to their stories and to their voices. I worked for a year at the shelter and I knew I had community here at UCSD and I knew I wanted to stay in San Diego. And when doing my research for PhD programs, I found out that UCSD was the only one on the only university here in San Diego that offers a PhD in literature. And I started to reconnecting with professors that I had um, had connection with under my undergraduate. And I started working on my on myself in the application. So I was actually working full time. And after my work, I would go to a coffee shop and plan for um, for my applications and really sit there and, and write for on my own. Um, when I received my acceptance letter, I was really excited to, to come to UCSD and I was also selected to participate in the Competitive Edge program, which is also like a summer bridge transitioning program. And um, when I was told that I had the opportunity to come back and be part of this program and that I was also awarded with a, with a fellowship, I knew that it was time for me to to come back. And it was really also, again, that financing component that really allowed me to step a little bit back from my position at the shelter and decide to to invest myself and commit to a PhD program. When I tell people that I'm a, a literature major, that I'm doing a PhD in literature, um, a lot of a lot of people get confused. <laughs> a lot of people don't really understand what I'm trying to do. They always ask me, so what are your methods? So how do you collect your data? How do you analyze your data? Um, I think even my parents were confused and they're like, why can't you do something like like law or medicine? Um, because the time frames are around the same, but it's 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 just interesting to see that everyone seems to to be confused as to as to what the literature PhD does um, and this is also a question that I've gotten from um, one of my one of the my professors from from history why why did I choose literature and not sociology or some other some other discipline where I can also study migration um, 
when I decided to come back to, to a PhD program, I knew I, I wanted to work with stories. I knew I wanted to center voices of, of migrants, migrant children and migrant Jews. And right now in my PhD program, what, I, what I'm working on and what I'm doing is really analyzing texts um, written by migrants, but also written by other Mexican authors and kind of discovering how literature is portraying the migrant reality. So any other, any other discipline, you're looking at the facts, you're collecting maybe testimonials, maybe you're collecting demographics data, you're analyzing um, maybe migration patterns, maybe here and there you'll have a story but I like literature and I chose literature because literature kind of allows you to imagine different worlds and it allows you to analyze what those imagined worlds might look like um, from different people. And right now I'm really trying to, to collect those stories and see if this is the reality we live in right now, how is literature allowing us to, to see other futures or other possibilities for migrant communities. And sometimes literature, because it's um, thought to be fiction, might be a little complicated, might be like, oh, what? like well, it's not, it might not be true, but it really allows you to, to imagine other possibilities. And I think that's why I'm really, um, I was really uh, pulled into, into going into, into this discipline and, and also it's an important period of time. It's a cultural artifact that allows you to see a different archive of the realities that we're living through in the present, which I think is, is something that maybe we understand history to be, but literature also allows us to see um, what, what is happening and maybe something that might not be published in history because it might be problematic or it might not have enough proof in literature is a little bit more open to 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 have it published and I think that's why literature is so important to me. Yeah, a year ago I I qualified, so I've been a PhD candidate for a year already and I feel like after qualifying the PhD day to day um, changes a little bit. So I'm not only um, studying or writing my dissertation right now, I'm actually also working and also trying to keep myself engaged with um, community work here on campus with the Rosa Research Centro. So I'm actually still working for them as a graduate learning specialist, um, supporting students with applications or just supporting students learning about what it is to go to a master's program or to go into a PhD program or just really motivating them to go out of state. I always tell everyone, go out of state. Um, so I will typically um, wake up and do my to-do list. And from there, I read, I write, I join a lot of meetings um, and I do my my other work on the side as well um, because we might get um, a lot of work thrown at us <laughs> or a lot of timelines. There's a lot of timelines. Sometimes it might be a little stressful, but I always try to, to break down my work and plan every day. Like this day, I'm going to read um, 200 pages and I'm going to write one or two pages. And that way I'm able to, to advance in the last month, I've been reading um, one book every two days, and I've been trying to write. I haven't been that successful in writing, but I've been trying to write at least a page. Um, so it's a lot of reading, a lot of writing, and and always trying to always also keep connected to, to the reality outside, because as we continue to do research um, and read a lot, it might be easy to just get absorbed into that world. So I also try to to keep myself, um, to kind of give myself that space to to go out and, and, and see what's happening outside of, of the reading and of the writing. 
But yeah, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, what day is it today? It's definitely a lot of work and it's definitely a lot of time that goes into into reading and writing, especially because I'm doing literature. I don't do a lot of, of field work. So I'm I'm actually have to be inside um doing my readings. But I think I think that if you really like what you do and you're really committed to to pursuing um a program then this becomes a it's not that much of a of a job but it's a it's a really amazing learning learning experience and as as graduate students as phd students we sometimes get money to do this work so it's amazing to to get paid to to learn don't be afraid to ask questions I believe that as a first generation student and someone who didn't have a lot of the academic support or like academic kind of background from parents, like I never learned that I could make questions and I was always afraid to go to different um, centers on campus, for example. Um, we have an amazing career center and I was always scared of going and asking for help or we have different um, resources on campus that I was always scared of, of taking advantage of. So I would tell students to really take advantage of the resources, um, to not be afraid to look for opportunities out of state. I believe that going out of state is an experience that everyone should have. And working at the Raza Research Centro, I met a lot of students who are really scared of leaving they're like no jessica i don't want to leave i want to stay here and i always encourage to to go out of state um i know i was one of those students who didn't want to leave but i know all the the growth that you can do if if you actually challenge yourself to go out um another thing is if you're not ready to commit maybe for six years five years and in the PhD program, you might want to look into into master's program. And while master's programs tend to not be funded, there are some that can help you financially. And ever since I started my education, I've been looking for the scholarships, apply for the scholarships, apply for all of them. Um, maybe you might, you might feel like it takes a lot of time or like there aren't enough out there, but there are. And after all the, the hard work and all the time that goes into applying, you might get something. And that that money is really what's going to help. Um, I feel like sometimes, at least for me, um, sometimes the, the main idea was like, oh, go to college, go to college, go to like master's or go to a PhD. But in the back of my mind, I was always like, how am I going to pay for this? So really look for, for scholarships and there's a ton of opportunities out there. So don't be afraid to apply for those and, and, to, and to talk to people who have already gotten them. Because a lot of times people who have already gotten a fellowship or a scholarship might be able to share their, their materials with you and you can get an idea of what um, of what the committees are looking for. And um, lastly, like, I know, uh, I know some, some folks might be, might be scared or might be maybe not too comfortable with creating networks or like talking to, to other people. But I feel like for me, one of the biggest thing was also having a network of professors that was there to motivate me, to guide me um, when I didn't know what what the next steps were. Um, again, like I mentioned before, the professors in the literature department really gave me amazing advice in, in going out of state the, and really not getting myself um, into debt by getting um, big loans just because I wanted to stay in San Diego when I already had the money and the opportunity to do a master's program somewhere else. So really look into into those um, opportunities out of state and really look for for creating that that network system that is gonna really be key 
as as we move forward not only not only in college but also in life i feel like networks are always are always um important important to have i think sometimes as first generation college students and a lot of us come from low income families as well we're pushed by our families to really start earning money fast or sometimes we feel like we have to support our families um and that maybe we have to make the decision to either continue helping our families like working or like exploring going into higher education and even though it is it is a lot of of hard work i believe that going through a PhD program or even a master's program really allows you to to grow and i learned this at, at, by working after my master's program that maybe if i hadn't completed those two extra two years i would have gotten paid way less money and so sometimes also thinking about what what is going to or how those two years might affect you in the future um Five years, six years might be a bit a bigger commit commitment, but I I meet a lot of students who tell me, hey, I cannot do it because two years means that I cannot help my family for two more years. But then, I I tell them maybe after those two years you can help them even more, and and they will help. They'll be grateful for that. So just to to consider like why do I want to do a master's or why do I want to do a PhD, or how can they affect. um my life in the future and if they bring something positive then definitely definitely do it